Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aya Saeed. I handle the ASHRAE office in Dubai, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. During the session, microphones will be muted by the organizer, and to ask questions, please submit them in the question box found in the control panel on the right side of your screen. Due to the number of participants, not all questions can be answered today. However, we will aim to answer all your questions after the session. Following the webinar, a PDF of the presentation, a certificate of attendance, and the recording of the webinar will be sent to all of you. And the recording will also be posted on the ASHRAE website. And now I'll pass it on to Mr. Nigel Cotton, our moderator for today. Omar? So my name is Nigel Cotton and I am your moderator for this webinar brought to you by the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Programme, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and the International Copper Association. First I'd like to ask Dr. Fukuya Inyo to introduce us to the project. Dr. Fukuya works for UNEDO, Department of Environment, and has managed environmental technology transfer projects in 40 developing countries while working for two UN agencies. Prior to his 15 years at the UN, he worked for the US and Japanese governments, including the US EPA. Dr. Fukuya, welcome to the webinar, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Nigel. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. As you might be uh, facing uh, wherever you are in, 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 this, in this world, the COVID-19 outbreak has disrupted the global supply chain, including cold value chains, which are critical for the distribution of foods and the vaccines. The refrigeration and air conditioning sector is currently responsible for around 17% of global electricity consumption, and in some developing countries, it even exceeds 40% of the national electricity demand. In order to reduce the impact on health and environment, it is vital to improve the energy efficiency of the refrigeration systems while adopting refrigerants that have zero or low impact, climate impact. We embarked on this project in 2018 uh, with the support uh, funded by the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program, KSEP, and uh, in partnership with the uh, International Copper Association. Uh, the project, which is assessment of incremental capital and operating cost for improved energy efficiency in domestic and commercial refrigeration, um, tackled on the barriers and also the energy efficiency opportunities and then the cost associated with the solution. The cost guidelines that uh, Dr. Abdelaziz will present today will come with the green refrigeration design tools which I truly hope encourage the manufacturing companies who are participating in this webinar to take energy efficiency actions, uh, practical actions in emerging economies. I'd like to also thank the five national ozone officers from Guatemala, Ecuador, Uganda, Lebanon, and Morocco, and the six participating companies in those five countries. I would like to also, also um, thank uh, ASHRAE to organize uh, this webinar. I hope, uh, I, I wish you a great uh, webinar and uh, thank you, Nigel. I will return the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fukur, for setting out the scene. Uh, so just a quick reminder, we will have Q&A session after the next speaker. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker and the author of the Guidance Report on Net Benefits and Costs for Energy Efficient Refrigeration Design Options, Dr. Omar Abdelaziz. Dr. Omar is Assistant Professor of Thermal Fluids at Ziwal City of Science and Technology, with more than 15 years of R&D and project management experience in energy efficient buildings, sustainable energy production and utilization, alternative cooling and heating technologies, and alternative refrigerants. Dr. Omar is a member of the Ozone Secretariat's Technology and Economic Assessment Panel and the co-chair of the Refrigeration, Air Conditioning and Heat Pumps Technical Options Committee. 
Dr. Omar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nigel. It's quite a pleasure to uh, to be amongst uh, you. And uh, good morning, good e afternoon, and good evening for everyone participating throughout the group. To set the stage, uh, I'd like to um, get a quick poll question uh, to understand the uh, composition of the of attendees. So please answer based on your role, whether you are a domestic refrigerator manufacturer, a commercial refrigerator manufacturer, an OEM, or like a uh, Original equipment manufacturer, R&D consultant, or an academic. So the call is open now. So if you'd like to make your selection, the poll will close in a few seconds. OK, so the answer to the quick poll was uh, domestic refrigerator manufacturers was 2%, commercial refrigerator manufacturers was 14%, OEM, uh, suppliers and compressors, ex heat exchanges, etc., was 14%. R&D consultants was 34%, and academia was 36%. Thank you to everybody that uh, took part in the poll. I go back to Omar. Um, thank you. This is uh, quite impressive to see such a uh, large variation in the distribution of the attendees. Uh, of course, uh, I welcome all uh, people from academia and R&D. But I was hoping also to see some more from the domestic manufacturing and the commercial manufacturing uh, manufacturers. Um, so to set the stage, why do we want to uh, work on refrigeration equipment? This is largely driven by the global warming that is accelerated faster than what was originally expected. According to the Inter uh, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, uh, we think that we can get we can, the temper, average temperature might increase about uh, about 1.5 degree between the year 2030 and the year 2052. Uh, if we continue with our business as usual uh, for energy equipment efficiency and refreshing fuel. What is alarming is that if uh, the temperature were to increase or exceed beyond two degrees, we would experience long lasting or irreversible impacts. Uh, Right now, the global refrigerator stock is about one and a half billion units that are consuming about 4% of the global electricity. We think that um, HFCs are rapidly urbanized and the rapid urbanization will increase the share of buildings and uh, greenhouse gases, gas emissions uh, over the future, over the, over the next few years. And as such, uh, further innovation, design and engineering solutions are needed quickly and at scale improve energy efficiency to optimize the, their utility, make sure that you use the, the equipment that you have in the most efficient way and to enable lower emission energy resources like using renewable energy uh, for your appliances. So in our report, uh, basically we developed guidelines and uh, guidance uh, to understand how we can get net benefit for energy efficiency, domestic and commercial refrigerators. Uh, we started by setting up the methodology through desk research. We also uh, went for site visits for the different participating uh, manufacturers and national office units, which I thank for, uh, uh, greatly for their uh, helpful. Uh, information and tips. We also did a lot of simulation studies to evaluate the performance of the, of the refrigerators, whether they are domestic or commercial under various conditions. Avoid um, uh, disclosing proprietary information, we developed what we call the Manufacturer's Development Index, uh, so, so that we, uh, we can uh, display the different values we got from our study. Um, without revealing proprietary information. 
for the simulation, we used the uh, Sera software. We will discuss it in details uh, in this uh, presentation. And finally, we developed the cost efficiency curve. After that, we analyzed the data, identified the barriers, and um, provided recommendations for the national ozone office units and the manufacturers. To start, uh, the manufacturer development index. Um, basically, this is a combined index that um, from which we can infer the development capacity at the manufacturer. Do they have enough modeling capabilities? Can the manufacturer perform experimental evaluation of the energy efficiency uh, options or the technologies? Uh, is the product development team capable of performing the modification? And whether they have a management in, in, in place to perform this uh, R&D cycle? So again, we gave uh, points um, for each of these uh, elements, and the sum would be 10. And then we have manufacturer production volume. Again, we look at the uh, manufacturer um, leadership, whether it's regional, national, or whether the manufacturer then is a medium scale or just a small producing manufacturer. And again, based on the answer, um, the value vary between zero and one, and uh, zero and 10, sorry. Uh, another important factor that impact uh, the energy efficiency technologies and how manufacturers can source their equipment and technologies is the relationship and proximity to the component OEM. Do they have a long-lasting relationship with the compressor manufacturer that can, that can um, and then develop uh, a strategy for the next five years on how to stage energy efficiency uh, compressors and uh, source uh, inverted technologies or use uh, high efficiency evaporator fans and so on and so forth. And for that, we uh, put um, the access to components and the ability to work with their supplier as the major questions to answer. And again, um, up to 10 points can be granted here. And then we look at the market maturity of the country, uh, whether there is enough consumer awareness, uh, whether uh, minimum efficiency performance standards are in place, and what kind of product competition is there? Is it just one manufacturing on the market, or is there a fierce market competition that is forcing the manufacturers to, to develop and innovate? Again, uh, based on the answers here, we can um, put uh, up to 10 points. And finally, we look at the country's energy efficiency score, which is a composite score uh, developed by the World Bank Price Index. Usually, this is uh, a value of 100. We normalize it to, to, to a value of 10. And then um, we will normalize the, the values. We give all of each of these elements um, uh, the, same, the same weight and end up with a value between 0 and 1 for each manufacturer. Uh, here we can see that the impact of MDI on the net benefit of energy efficiency versus cost. So for example, if the manufacturer uh, is, has a, a, some of a lower manufacturer development index, it would take him, like they can improve the efficiency quite a lot because there is not much competition. The equipment as they produce is not necessarily the most efficient refrigerator or equipment, and they have quite a room for improvement. Whereas if you are a well-developed manufacturer, you are already pushing your equipment efficiency because you want to claim this leadership in your market. And as such, um, it's hard to reach 30% efficiency improvement. However, uh, another important factor is the cost, the incremental manufacturing cost to reach the, the efficiency improvement differs whether you are a, a low MDI, low or medium MDI, or whether you are at a high MDI. Because when you when you are at a higher MDI, it, you have a well-established relationship with your OEM suppliers. You can source equipment uh, and uh, the energy efficient technology options options more cost effectively. You know the externalities. You can save uh, on cost by doing things, um, and as such, you can see here that the. Uh, the, the slope of the curve is less steeper than the slope of the curve here for some of the uh, options in the medium scale uh, manufacturing facilities. 
Reducing the global warming potential depends on the refrigerant choice. It's easy. We move from uh, R134A to isobutane, we get um, almost 1,000 fold reduction in global warming potential. However, improving energy efficiency depends greatly on the design choice. What are we going to do? In, in our study, we looked at isobutane or hydrocarbon 600A for domestic appliances and propane or hydrocarbon 290 for commercial applications. Um, we understood the potential energy efficient technologies that are available on the market, modeled the baseline along with energy, efficient, energy efficiency technology options using uh, CERA, and then evaluated the net benefit of energy efficiency versus price premium using the cost analysis workbooks. Uh, these uh, models are available at uh, unit.org forward slash CERA. You can download the uh, document, this document, you can download the brochure, and there are the links for the software. Uh, here we de demonstrated the, the refrigeration choice. In domestic applications, you can move from HFC 134A to hydrocarbon 600A. There is a significant reduction in global warming potential, about 1,000 times less. However, with isobutane comes the safety designation issue because isobutane is explosive. In terms of energy efficiency, it can be up to 3% better than uh, the HFC 134A. And in terms of uh, state safety implications, we need to be careful in our manufacturing, like uh, manufacturing facility. There are precautions necessarily necessary for the design, uh, manufacturing, and servicing, and uh, as well as disposal. Um, it's very important to minimize leakage. So if you are not testing or if you are not doing helium tests with R134A, you need to do helium tests with 600A. Uh, in terms of cost difference, there is not much uh, difference between 134A and uh, hydrocarbon 600A. Uh, in terms of maintenance, now you need more trained technicians. They need to be able to identify that this is a flammable or an explosive refrigerant. They need to be uh, aware of the uh, safety requirements to handle the, the uh, service request. In terms of end, end of life, it's easy for isobutane because you can just safely vent it or recover it. However, for R134A, it has to be recovered and destroyed or recycled. So now this adds uh, an additional layer. And in terms of future use, um, it is being phased out in the Europe, in the European Union, and the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol has phased down its use. When we look at the commercial applications, we see here that we are going to replace uh, r 400 404A with hydrocarbon 290. There is 4,000 fold reduction in the global warming potential. But again, we get this issue of flammability. I, uh, uh, propane is usually 5 to 10 percent better than uh, R404A. There are some uh, needed uh, precautions for the safety and design issues. The cost again is on um, par. It might even be cheaper in some cases, especially with higher uh, MDI facilities, they can work with their suppliers, uh, with their compressor suppliers to get the compressors at a very competitive rate. Um, and again, 404A is being phased out in European Union and phased down by the Montreal Protocol. Now, when we talk about energy efficiency technology options, uh, we have to look at the refrigerator and, and the various components. There is a cabinet, there is a sealed system, there, is, there are controls. If you look at the cabinet, you can change the dimensions and the insulation, and that impacts the cooling load on the, on the system. And we, when we reduce the cooling load, we improve the efficiency. Also, the gaskets and heat leaks. Um, most refrigerators would have door gaskets to minimize the heat leak. The door gasket design can be done with uh, a single chamber, a dual chamber, or a three chamber to reduce the heat leaks. Um, the, the magnet that is inserted to improve the tightness also change like impacts the, the heat leaks. Um, we also try to minimize the insertion. For example, if you look at the top mount cabinet that have uh, water dispenser or ice dispenser, the water and ice dispensers are considered to be heat leaks, so we, not, we try to minimize these. Uh, the anti-sweat heaters, how do we 
put them to minimize um, the heat leak into the refrigerator, but at the same time, perform the, the required action, which is avoiding any uh, sweat on the external surface of the refrigerator. For the sealed system, we have the option for uh, alternative compressors. We have options to improve the evaporator design, to improve the condenser design, to change the suction line heat exchanger. For the controls, um, most, most uh, domestic equipment have mechanical controls. However, when we move to um, commercial equipment, we can start to look at electronic controls, uh, electronic uh, controls using Internet of Things, um, which have significant impact on efficiency. Uh, in open literature, there are a lot of studies. Uh, this is an example for a, a refrigerator where we can uh, significantly reduce the energy consumption. Um, and you can see here, the baseline refrigerator would be using about 581 kilowatt hour per year. If we increase the insulation to 60 millimeter throughout, you reduce the energy consumption by 9%, and the estimated uh, cost is $1. If uh, we increase the insulation in the freezer section to 80 millimeters, like a centimeter, we get significant energy savings from the baseline, 30%, and the cost is not significant, one and a half dollars. Uh, if we improve the compressor energy efficiency ratio, we see that we almost double the energy savings. We, we achieve 65% energy savings at an incremental cost uh, of uh, $48 from the baseline. And then um, looking at other options for uh, load minimization, like increasing the thermal insulation or using uh, vacuum insulated panels, uh, you can reach 84% energy savings from the baseline at $65 uh, incremental cost. And finally, if you want to use the best in class uh, compressor with an energy efficiency ratio of 6.57, this is uh, this was actually a theoretical compressor based on the linear uh, oil-free compressor technology. Uh, so this might not be happening anytime soon. And you can see here that the incremental cost is significant. Nonetheless, we can see that we reduced the energy consumption from 580. 0.7 kilowatt hour per year to 95.6 through um, changes in thermal insulation and compressor technology. For commercial refrigerators, uh, there are several uh, options, uh, 20 to 30 options found. Um, they are uh, available in details in the guidance document. Here we just give a brief um, introduction about them. So there are technologies like the anti-fogging glass this reduce the need or eliminate the need to have to, have, to, have to put heating element uh, in the glass window. Um, improving the cabinet airflow can improve the efficiency by 15% with almost negligible cost. Um, fan motors have significant impact uh, on energy efficiency and the cost variation depends greatly on the equipment and the MDI. Um, we found also the compressors to be significant um, Source for energy savings 30 to 40 percent. Um, other technologies like the frost techniques, uh, heat exchanger optimization, using vacuum insulated panels, um, leak minimization, and higher efficiency refreshment. You can see the art of reports 2014 and 2018. Um, in terms of SERA modeling tool, um, this was initially developed by the US EPA and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the 1990s to evaluate the alternative refrigerants for uh, the SNAP rule, the significant uh, alternative refrigerant uh, program at, uh, in the US. And then later on, uh, DOE adopted the tool for the uh, technical support document and the minimum efficiency performance standard to rule making. However, for the last uh, 10 years or so, there has been um, almost no um, change or modification to the tool. And now UNIDO uh, and KSAP are uh, picking up the tool and trying to um, provide the required uh, maintenance and uh, update for it. Sarah itself is a dynamic model, which uses physical dimensions and engineering data, like compressor map, uh, heat exchanger design, fans, um, the thermal insulation size and thickness and properties. Uh, there are dialog boxes uh, that help you uh, build your equipment. 
and then uh, once the baseline uh, model is um, simulated you can uh, compare the result from the simulation to the result uh, uh, from the experimental test and find how to um, calibrate the model once you have the calibrated model you would be able to perform a series of design modifications what we call design options and for each design option you would be able to run the model get the new energy consumption and understand the, um, the net benefit of uh, energy efficiency versus cost for the different design options so to be able to um, effectively use sara uh, you will have to allocate time in the engineering staff for the project um, download sara from github and this is the link to download it. Uh, download the cost analysis workbook also from GitHub. You need to gather the data using the questionnaire. Um, this questionnaire is uh, shown in the document, the net benefit document that is available on uh, the website, uh, the Unido forward slash Sera. Then we run the simulation of the base case, uh, replace components, and rerun the simulation. From a manufacturer point of view, this, these are the main steps, right? You gather all the required engineering data. It's very important at this step to contact OEMs. I'm pleased to see 14% of the attendees being OEMs here, because OEMs know what are the energy efficiency technology options. Uh, and OEMs, for example, for uh, evaporator fans, know how they can move from a low efficiency, uh, low efficiency shaded pole fan to a high efficiency um, ECM fan and the impact of something like this. Um, compressor, there are compressors that are uh, with energy efficiency ratio of four, but we can get all the way to five or even five and a half, maybe six. Uh, other technology options may be uh, the, the insulation material. If we can optimize the, insu the insulation material and each higher um, resistivity or lower thermal conductivity. Then we do the equipment energy modeling using CERA. It's very important at this step to start to estimate the cost premium. And we can get this a lot from the cost premium from the technical support documents, whether it's the US Department of Energy or the Equi Design from the European Union. Other um, countries have done um, significant NEP studies, including Brazil, uh, India, China. There are also enough uh, information in open literature, but at the end of the day, if you are a manufacturer and you want to get the most accurate uh, information, you need to contact your OEM, contact your uh, compressor supplier, understand exactly what will be the cost premium and so on. In terms of incremental cost estimate, we have the capital cost. For example, if we are trying to modify the thermal insulation thickness of a refrigerator, we have to create new injection modes. We need to um, uh, change the metal siding of the cabinet and this comes with a significant capital cost and if, uh, if we do not amortize it then we have an issue so we need to understand the difference between capital and operating cost for example for this, the foam the operating cost you have to use more for foam material right if we are using uh, if we are moving from uh, hfc 134a to isobutane there is capital uh, cost involved with the uh, safety equipment, the charging machines, and so on. But there is also operating cost because you save on the cost of your uh, refreshment, but you have to use more trained technicians and you have to pay higher premium for the insurance. So these are things that has to be accounted for. Uh, in term, and finally, once you have these things, you start to obtain the cost efficiency curve. So you, like, as you change your, uh, your efficiency, uh, what would be the cost of these uh, uh, combined efficiency. So it's time you open Sarah and build your own model. And once you build the model, you run the model, you achieve the simulation or you get the simulation results. You can see here uh, the thermal load on the cabinets, whether it's the freezer, the crush, or the food, or the total. And then you look at the results for the refrigeration cycle, the compressor power consumption, and the total um, kilowatt hour per day can modify or choose a replace one, one component for example here we can change the compressor and once we change the compressor we, we see that we repeat the simulation and see, and see the impact of course changing the compressor sometimes might end up uh, reducing the 
the cycle duty, and if you reduce the cycle, the duty cycle, you would uh, you reduce your energy consumption and heat, the, uh, the heat leaks to this. Uh, so it's it's time for a demonstration here for a live demonstration. So we will go to Sarah. Uh, here I will open um, uh, a generic model that I mean this is uh, the first the first thing to do is to pick the cabinet design. Um, in the cabinet design, what we see here is uh, the choice between six different cabinet designs. We have top mount, bottom mount, side by side, upright chest freezer or uh, single door uh, refrigerator. So here I'm using the top, top mount cabinet. We provide the outside dimensions of the cabinet and then the liner properties. We have an out, uh, outer liner, usually it's a steel liner. And um, we have uh, an inner liner, usually a thermoplastic liner. And that's why you can see that the outer liner is uh, half a millimeter thick, whereas the inner liner is two millimeter uh, and the thermal conductivity is different. Then we start to define the compartment. And the compartment, we can say whether the compressor is below the refrigerator or not. In typical uh, bottom mount of uh, top mount cabinets, the compressor would be uh, uh, below a part of the cabinet. And we can say the height of the compressor, the top depth, and the bottom depth, because usually that is um, like a difference between the top depth, depth and the bottom depth here. And here we define the wall thickness um, above the compressor compartment and on the side of the compressor compartment. We also important, uh, we, another important thing is to identify the freezer storage volume and the fresh food so storage volume. Next, we go into defining the freezer cabinet. So uh, the top wall, what is the thickness of the top wall? And um, here, these are in centimeter. And then what is the thermal property of the, of, of the wall? The, the, the thermal property is defined in terms of resistivity. And the resistivity is basically uh, one over the thermal conductivity. However, the unit used here is meter square degree C per watt centimeter. And when you choose this uh, unit, it's basically one over the thermal conductivity divided by 100. So if the thermal conductivity is 0.02, uh, the inverse of it would be 50, and then you divide by, by, by 100, it becomes 0.5. Here, we assume that the thermal conductivity of the uh, insulation, the polyurethane uh, uh, foam is uh, 0.018, and as such, the resistivity with this unit would be 0.555. Another important factor for the freezer cabinet is to understand the door flange. How is the door um, at the, the end of the door uh, looking like? You can see here uh, we uh, the flange width, which is the, the thinnest portion of the door, and the flange the wedge depth, uh, how far it takes to reach the normal wall, uh, door depth. And these are just uh, typical geometric dimensions and uh, what kind of resistivity we, we fill the door with. Uh, as I discussed earlier, the gasket heat leak, and again, the gasket heat leak here is defined as watts per meter for 100, times, 100 degrees temperature difference between indoor and outdoor. Usually, gasket heat leaks are uh, simulated using finite element, and after you do the finite element analysis, you can come up uh, with a value that you use here. Um, most uh, double chamber gaskets would have a, a heat leak around between 7 and 10 watt per meter, 100 degrees uh, Celsius. And when you have three chambers, you can go down to six. Another thing is the cabinet penetration. Usually, there is no cabinet penetration for freezers, but for food compartment or fresh food, you might, you might end up with uh, cabinet penetration from the uh, water dispenser or the ice dispenser. And again, we define the side wall, the back wall, and the bottom wall, the thickness and thermal resistance. Uh, another important uh, geometrical parameter in uh, top mount cabinet is the existence of mullion or the separator between the uh, freezer compartment and the fresh food compartment. And this is how we define uh, the, the location of the mullion, the thickness at the center, and the thermal resistivity. And now we also define the doors. The doors can be solid, 
or they can be glass. Of course, glass, in, uh, if we are working with uh, commercial refrigerators, but in most uh, residential or domestic refrigerators, they will be solid. And then we define the door opening schedule. Here, they, there is no, open, no door opening just for service. And finally, here it's important to define the room temperature uh, based on the code that uh, you are testing your uh, or modeling your equipment uh, based on. So the room air temperature, uh, under cabinet air temperature. So this depends greatly on the circulation in the room, the air entering the condenser, the compressor compartment, and then the set points for the freezer and the fresh food. Next, we define the controls, uh, whether you have um, defrost uh, or whether you have a manual defrost and uh, what kind of cycle dependent uh, controls control energy which means that if the system is on there is one and a half watt of uh, electricity being consumed outside and there are constant controls or not so in a, in a typical domestic refrigerator there is no um, constant control and then we define the anti-sweat heat so we have electric anti-sweat heat we also have liquid anti-sweat heat uh, anti-sweat heaters and you can see here, uh, we can also define vapor anti-sweat heaters if we want. Uh, liquid and vapor anti-sweat anti heaters add to the uh, cooling capacity for the condenser. Um, and uh, as such are sometimes more favorable. Uh, electric anti-sweat heaters add to the electricity consumption and uh, are not necessarily more efficient. So now we have the cabinet well defined. We move next to the cycle data, which is the sealed system. Uh, to begin with, we are using R134A as our refrigerant. Um, we are assuming that there is there are some cycling losses. We define the evaporator. Uh, so there is three degrees uh, C of superheat. You can define different uh, pin designs, although the plain pin is the most widely used for evaporators. It's important that we define the fan very accurately here because the fan in um, top mount cabinet is inside the freezer and all the power consumed by the fan would be dissipated inside the cabinet and added as a heat source to the load. So if the fan power is 10 watts, that like the fan, to run the fan you need 10, 10 watts and you have a motor efficiency of 40% like Typical shielded, motor, uh, shielded uh, pole motors, then you are dissipating 10 divided by 0.4, which is roughly 25 uh, watts of uh, power whenever the fan is running. Uh, so, this is very important to understand. Now, we define the uh, number of pressure flow circuits, uh, the tube outer diameter, the wall thickness, um, the width of the tube row. Uh, so, basically, we define everything related to the heat exchanger. And then also we define the fins on the heat exchanger, the fraction of tube with thin surface. Sometimes here we try to come up with an average value because the fins are not consistent throughout the heat exchanger. And um, this can be one of the parameters that we need to tweak in order to, to calibrate our model with the experimental data. For the condenser, there are four types of condensers that can be modeled. Static, which means a static condenser, no pan. Uh, it can be hot wall, which is uh, used primarily for uh, some of the domestic uh, refrigerators and chest freezers. We have tube and fin, and we have microchip. Here for our design, I'm just using a static wall condenser. Again, you have to define the subcooling. And then you provide the data for the condenser in terms of uh, tube diameter, uh, wire thickness, number of wires, and so on. And then we have to define the compressor. Um, here I'm using a low efficiency, or not low, but baseline efficiency condenser from QBGEL. And you can see here the um, capacity is 193 kilocalories per hour with an energy efficiency ratio of 3.93. And uh, what you can see here is you can see the compressor map. So between 40 to 60 degrees C condensing temperature and minus 35 to 10 degrees C evaporating temperature, we have the capacity in kilocalorie per hour and the power more. 
a very interesting thing here that uh, you can do is you can add a capacity multiplier and a power multiplier as well as speed multiplier. So these would help you like if, if you don't have the exact compressor that you want to work with, but you know you can work with your supplier to get uh, a, a larger compressor or a smaller compressor that meets your your, uh, your capacity, you can change this capacity multiplier to each what you want. Finally, uh, to close the sealed system, we have the suction line heat exchanger. And basically, we you can either, either define it user the effectiveness or user using the um, inlet, uh, specify the inlet temperature. I prefer to use the effectiveness um, and 90% is about um, an acceptable value for most uh, interchangers I've seen in, uh, in real life. Finally, once you have done that, you go here, you describe your analysis. So basically I say it's a baseline generic system. And then I save, file, save, and then I go begin the simulation. So once I do that, I see here that the freezer set point, fresh food set point, I see the total thermal loads. Here, the total thermal loads, the fan heat is 11.2 watts out of 53. That's almost 20% of the freezer load is coming from the fan. And you can see that the freezer load is more than 60% or, or almost 60% of your uh, total uh, refrigerator load. With this design, you, you find that your baseline energy consumption is 2.377. So if I open here, my design option sheet, I put my baseline as 2.377. Okay, what would be the first thing I want to change in this um, model? So maybe what I, the first thing I want to change is I want to go here and change the evaporator fan from using a shaded pole to something that is, uh, let's say, an ECM fan with a more, more, more efficient, um, so it's a, an ECM fan, and the fan blades are more efficient. So if you improve the fan blades, maybe you can get 50% improvement. So instead of using 10 watts, you can use eight watts. And instead of motor efficiency of 40% with shaded pole, you can go all the way to 80% efficiency. Now I say next, next, finish. And now I say, I will also um, use improved Okay. okay, and now save as this would be design option number one. And I go ahead and begin the simulation. You can see that the thermal load reduced almost by 10%, sorry, by 20%, went from 11 to 40, from 11 to 4. And when you do that, the total kilowatt hour per day is 2.037, so I put 2.037 here. You find that just by changing the evaporator fan, the energy consumption of your refrigerator is reduced by 14%. Now, it's important to try to find what is the incremental cost for a fan like this, um, based on guidance from manufacturers that I work with and uh, talk, uh, talking with different OEMs. The value can be anywhere from four to ten dollars, depending on the MDI, depending on the relationship with OEM. I'm, I'm putting here four. I want to put, change that to five? That's fine. Okay. Now let's move to the next thing. Let's try to use a more efficient compressor. So we go here, go to the compressor, and instead of using this compressor, we try to find a more efficient compressor. So maybe we can use the 134A. This one, 4.95. So we move from 3.93 to 4.95, the same capacity. And again, analyze, describe, use higher ER compressor. And save as this would be design option two. And now, you can see here that the load did not change, right? But the energy consumption dropped significantly from 2.037 to 1.629. So 1.629, and that reduced the energy consumption by 31%. Significant energy efficiency improvement. 
Now, what would be the next uh, change, uh, next major modification? Let's move from R134A to uh, R600A. So we go here, cycle, cycle parameter, instead of R134A, use R600A. But remember, the compressor that was selected was an R134A compressor. So we have to switch to a 600A compressor. And now describe all R600A. And again, now we see a reduction in the energy consumption because isobutane is roughly 3% better. And you can see here that, well, you only get 2% improvement, 31% to 33%. Now, if you compare the cost of the uh, isobutane to the cost of the um, high efficiency compressor, the, the, uh, the compressors themselves from the supplier would roughly be at the same cost. However, you would save on the refrigerant cost, and that's why you have incremental material cost is negative. However, you have to hire high uh, skilled labor, so that's why I'm adding a dollar for the labor. And uh, for overhead, because you have to pay higher insurance premium or there are other um, things you have to uh, comply with, I'm adding a dollar. Finally, we can another thing we can do is we can change the intensification thickness. And when I change the intensification thickness, I assume incremental material cost of $5. And you can see here that we reach 41% um, efficiency reduction. So this is the first step to looking at the design options. The next step is to look at the uh, depreciation cost, the manufacturer markup, and the cumulative cost. So you can see here, um, with efficient evaporator fan, the cumulative uh, added cost is 6.3 because we have to add the manufacturer markup. If you look at changing the compressor, it jumped to 12.6. Changing the refrigerant, it's 15.7. And then increase, increasing the insulation is 22. A very important part here is determining the depreciation. How are you going to determine the depreciation factor? So for the, for the refrigerant, I had to use um, uh, fail safe mechanisms. I have to add uh, safety systems, uh, sensors, uh, new charging machines, and so on and so forth. I'm putting here uh, $250,000. Maybe the number, the right number is $500,000. I don't know, right? Now, I also have to know like, what is the average production volume? If I am developing, if I can produce 100,000 units every year, right? and I want to depreciate this capital over three years, then the depreciation is going to be 500,000 divided by 100,000, that's $5 divided by three uh, years. So basically, I each refrigerator would have a cost uh, equivalent cost of 1.67 to account for the depreciation. And that's why the total cumulative markup is, is high. Um, for the uh, increase the insulation. Um, what is an incremental capital cost? You have to buy new molds or you have to develop your new injection molds. Uh, sometimes you would have uh, to change the metal forming machines and so on. And again, you need to know, like, because here, the, when you change the, the refreshment, you can change the refreshment for the entire fleet of, of equipment, right? So you, you can depreciate for the, the entire volume. However, when you increase the insulation thickness, this is for a specific refrigerator design. So you have to start with the one that is, um, that is highest, uh, like highest volume. So here I'm assuming um, 80,000 and again over three years. And then you end up with this uh, cost efficiency curve. So on the bottom, you see the increase in dollars. And on the vertical axis, you see the increase in efficiency. So you, you want this curve to be as steep as possible because the steeper it is, the more efficiency you get for less cost. And the less steep means that you have to pay more cost to achieve higher efficiency. So uh, going back to the slides, 
um, based on our investigations and uh, side visits for the five different for the six different manufacturers um, for domestic refrigerators, we found that changing the insulation is an effective technology in in most, not all. Um, higher, higher efficiency evaporator fan was always uh, an important factor, and it was found that we can actually save cost if we can do it in a clever way in some aspects. Uh, using inverted compressor also had a significant impact on efficiency, and uh, there is significant um, value, significant difference in the incremental operating cost depending on the manufacturer development index. And finally, um, also using improved compressor, just improving the compressor using higher energy efficiency ratio compressor would have a different value. For commercial refrigerators, not all um, companies that we visited had commercial refrigerators, but for those that had commercial refrigerators, we see that uh, improved uh, insulation glazing units uh, for doors is by far the most impactful in terms of energy efficiency. However, the incremental operating cost can be uh, quite different. Um, another as aspect is the using electronically commutated motors for fan designs, both for the evaporator and condenser, and you can achieve significant efficiency improvement. And finally, using digital controller with IoT can provide an additional 30% efficiency improvement. However, the cost can be significant and up to $55. Per, per, per refrigerator um, produce. Now, looking at the incremental capital cost, um, we found that for, for uh, increasing the insulation thickness, changing the modes for, like, for a company like that is of high MDI, they have very strict rules for their um, quality, and as such, the changing the, in, the inside and outside of the cat of the uh, refrigerator to achieve the required insulation meant a significant operation, including um, shipping uh, changes, uh, shipping equipment changes, and so on. And we end up with 4.1 million dollars for the complete production lines. For a company, for other companies, it was roughly in the order of 50 thousand dollars per base model. So for each base model, they would like to change. It would cost about fifty thousand dollars to change uh, the insulation uh, for um, the gasket. Uh, it was found that roughly each manufacturer, like the gasket, would cost between three to nine thousand dollars to improve uh, the the gasket or to reduce the gasket heat. In terms of the uh, refrigerant conversion um, and trying to move from non-flammable to flammable uh, refrigerants, the cost varied significantly based on the uh, MDI. And you can see that for low MDI, the manufacturer can get by with minimal um, safety requirements or just to com complying with minimal safety requirements, and he just may, might need one charging machine. Whereas when you have a large operation, you end up with a large number of charging machines, um, and uh, more sophisticated uh, system for control for controls. Uh, you have uh, more sophisticated storage and distribution, and as such, um, the the cost can be uh, almost two million dollars. So with that, I'd like to open uh, another poll question and um, know from your background and your expertise. What is the most important technology option that uh, would be uh, would that would improve the refrigerator energy efficiency? I'd leave, uh, maybe I'll leave uh, five seconds for you to uh, answer the, the poll question. So the poll is now open. And the results are now in. So changing to a more efficient compressor 
was 48%. Reducing door gasket heat leaks was 6%. Changing the refrigerant was 16%. Changing insulation thickness and type, 19%. And replacing the evaporator fan to more efficient fans, 11%. And, Thank um, you. Thanks, um, Nigel. So um, I appreciate the, the, the end response. And indeed, I think the compressor is the heart of uh, a refrigerator. And 48% is, um, to me, seems right. It's important to change the compressor to achieve higher efficiency. However, I was sur surprised to see that the evaporator fan is only 11% with the results that I showed you. Um, the evaporator fan basically uh, when you improve the efficiency of, of the evaporator fan, you are doubling down because you are reducing the power consumed by the fan, but also you are reducing the heat leaks into the uh, freezer. So it's very important to, to improve the evaporator fans, and now they are available at a more cost-effective rate. So um, please make this a larger consideration for you as you move forward. Um, so, uh, based on the study that we made, we looked at the emission reduction. How do um, these conversion projects, like if we were to change the refrigerant and at the same time do the bare minimum for um, efficiency improvement? So, the efficiency improvement depends greatly on the MDI. And you can see here that um, the baseline emissions from the refrigerant, from the refrigerants, the baseline emissions from the uh, electricity consumption over the lifetime, and then we see the uh, the reduction, the, the emission from the refrigerant due to the, the conversion from um, HFCs to um, hydrocarbons. You can see here significant reduction, significant reduction from almost. 30,000 to only 22 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. For this manufacturer, it went from 111,000 tons of CO2 equivalent to only 28. So significant reduction in direct emissions. Now, when we look at the indirect emissions, which is very important, uh, you, you see here that with the high MDI manufacturer, it went from 278,000 to 254, almost uh, reduced by half. So this refrigerant, this refrigerant manufacturer, which is the highest MDR, is looking at combining efficiency improvement with refrigerant conversion to double down on emission reduction. Whereas with these manufacturers, uh, they went to the minimum possible route for efficiency improvement. And basically, that was the efficiency improvement that you would get normally by using uh, the compressor like a one step up compressor or a, a little bit a little bit better compressor with your uh, refrigeration conversion and with that you see that the indirect emission emissions uh, was reduced from 357 to 321,000 for this MDI and for the load for this MDI went from 2.9 to 2.4 million uh, another important factor that impacts the indirect emission is the uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour uh, consumed. So um, in this MDI, for this manufacturer, they are in a country that is largely driven by hydroelectric power. And as such, the, um, the emissions, the electric emissions is quite low. And that's why you see, while they have significant number of refrigerators produced, the indirect emissions is quite lower than, than, than this uh, manufacturer. Now, if we were to use the maximum available potential for energy efficiency for these three manufacturers, how much energy emissions reductions can, can be achieved? Here, you can see instead of 136, the maximum potential, it would be 157. Almost 20% increase in emissions reduction if we double down on energy efficiency. For this manufacturer, it, the emissions reduction would go from 65 to 190, almost three folds increase, not 20%, almost three folds increase in emissions reduction. And for this manufacturer, it would be almost also 
um, 50 percent, uh, so almost um, 100 percent increase in emissions reduction. In terms of market barrier um, for domestic uh, refrigerators, just some examples. Uh, please see the guidance document for the full list. Uh, we found that the consumer behavior is a main deterrent to energy efficiency. Uh, they are driven mainly or exclusively by first cost. Uh, usually, um, consumers are not aware of energy benefits to themselves or the society. And uh, we found energy labels, if they uh, are available, are not well appreciated and um, not well understood. So there is a need for educational campaigns to improve um, this aspect of the consumer behavior. We also found that the consumers are looking for more reliable refrigerators, especially in developing countries where electricity is, um, is, uh, is not reliable. It's what is more important for them is for the refrigerator to be resilient, uh, and to operate over extended periods of uh, electricity um, short. We also found lack of uh, maps to be an important issue and um, lack of governmental financial incentives for energy efficiency appliances. For commercial products, uh, we found that the main issue is that sales are primarily controlled by the business-to-business -business sales. These are driven uh, primarily by the client's specifications and guidelines. Uh, usually, they are more progressive than national or regional maps, so it's, a, it's good for energy efficiency. However, they lock the manufacturer in one direction rather than leaving the opportunity for the manufacturer to um, innovate and get the most out of their um, engineering R&D uh, portfolio. Um, also, the customer consolidation entered the commercial refrigerator market as a buyer market which increased the client purchase power, so pushing to smaller margins, but guaranteed volume. Um, as such, manufacturers cannot afford to increase $20 in components unless it is mandated by the B2B customers. For non-institutional customers, uh, they are primarily driven by first post and have limited appreciation of the life cycle, monetary and societal benefit of the energy efficiency. And we found that for those non-institutional customers, the acceptable payback is roughly 18 months. So with that, I'd like to close with this uh, poll question. Um, to know from your um, expertise, uh, what do you think that um, uh, the main barrier beyond cost in uh, moving towards energy efficiency so is it the import from large overseas manufacturers, uh, the lack of awareness about the benefit of energy efficiency, the lack of financial support for design and development? So the poll is now open. And the results are in. So, imports for large from large overseas manufacturers is 12%. Lack of awareness about the benefit of energy efficiency is 57%. Lack of financial support for design and development is 31%. And back to you, Omar. Um, thanks a lot, Nigel. Uh, thanks a lot for um, the attendees. I think um, the re these results are quite uh, accurate and. Uh, it's important to develop educational campaign to show the benefits of energy efficiency beyond that just the reduction in energy consumption. Every dollar saved in utility payment um, can be um, can return on the economy times and times again. And this is a point that is not well understood by consumers in general. Uh, also, uh, the lack of financial support for design and development is an important factor factor because most of the manufacturers in developing countries don't have the capacity or the capabilities to do it when they are uh, like bending over backwards just to comply with local maps. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank the companies that uh, helped uh, make this uh, study um, 
the companies, the national zone of these units, um, uh, and uh, would like to return back the floor to Najib. Okay, Omar, maybe we just move to the next slide, which has the where can we get the resources from. Um, here we have a, a series of um, websites we, which you, we can refer to. Um, the unado.org Sierra site will be the main one there. You can download the report, the brochure, and access to the Sierra GitHub. Um, so if you're at all unstuck, you start with the unado.org slash Sierra. The others are just contact details for myself and Omar. So if you need any further questions, etc., please um, follow up with that. Let's move to the next slide. So this is the start of the Q&A session. So as a reminder, just take the opportunity to ask your questions by using the question box on the right hand side. And if there's not enough uh, time to answer them all, then we'll get back to you by email. So the first question um, coming in, uh, some of them are, are technical and some of them are just for, for clarity. So um, the first question is, uh, any attention being directed to strategies in order to blunt the propensity of all cooling equipment to suffer heat transfer coil fouling over time once it's placed into service? which necessitates ongoing preventative maintenance. It's a little bit off topic for us, but I don't know if you want to make a, a slight comment. Um, in the first um, part, yeah, preventative maintenance is important. Sorry. Yes, uh, for sure, preventative maintenance is, is important, but again, uh, the scope of our work was primarily on the design of new equipment, how to make sure that the new equipment is more efficient. Uh, the discussion about preventative maintenance um, was um, taken at length at the Energy Efficiency Task Force reports for the TIP um, uh, in 2018, 2019, and also I think this year will 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 be included. And we we see that if uh, the condenser is uh, clean and uh, you have the the right amount of refrigerant charge, then your system is going to operate at the, the appropriate performance or opt optimal performance and as you accumulate dirt uh, as the refreshment starts to leak you start to um, deteriorate the performance okay so let's move on to one of the more um, specific questions what do you mean by improved gasket what kind of gasket is it <clears throat> so the gasket basically is um, uh, like the, the rubber part that is around the door, right? And the gasket uh, in typical uh, refri refrigerators would have uh, um, a magnetic strip and then up the dual, dual uh, chambers, right? Uh, and each of these chambers is filled, is, is like an air pocket. And that air pocket like push, like is pushed between uh, the door and uh, the side of the refrigerator. So if if you have just one pocket, one air pocket, the, temper the thermal resistance is low. If you have two air pockets, you have higher thermal resistance. If you have three air pockets, you have even better uh, thermal resistance. So how do you design a, a, an improved gasket depends on the gasket supplier. Usually this is beyond a typical refrigerator manufacturer uh, development. So you have to work with your gasket supplier and do the finite element analysis to find what is the expected uh, heat leak from this gasket design. So the next question is from Lugas. Um, he says, I think this is an impressive tool for manufacturers. However, there seems to be an extensive amount of uh, input required. Uh, how do you expect the practitioner to use it conveniently and how do you perform the cost analysis? Now that was then, you, you showed the two together, there was a follow-up question later as to whether the Excel spreadsheet, this was from Amit, whether the Excel spreadsheet uh, will be made available to attendees. So. Yes, uh, the Excel spreadsheet, I was just making some final touches on them. They will be made available and they would be uh, on the GitHub uh, repository as well. 
So you would be able to uh, put the different uh, design options, and as you move in the, with the design options, you would be able to progressively see how um, the cost efficiency curve uh, develops. So, so up from experience, we're looking at once you've got your data, the actual use of the data and producing the results relatively quick, maybe a morning. But a lot of you've got a lot of thought has got to go into getting the right data at the beginning of the exercise. And, yes, and how I to think. Yes, yeah, so so I think it was mentioned in one of the slides where like the first thing is collecting the data dedicating engineering time this is not uh, an afterthought this is um, a, 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 an integral and synergistic part of your r d cycle um, and you have to think about it as okay this i have a baseline refrigerator and i want to improve it so if you are a manufacturer you have your baseline equipment you know everything about this baseline equipment you just need to model it and that that modeling if you have everything ready and take a morning, as you said, if you don't have everything, if you don't have that um, engineering drawing, you will just start using uh, measuring tape and uh, uh, counting fins and, and things like that. And maybe instead of going on for a day, maybe it, it is uh, a morning, maybe it's a day or, or, or two. It's not going to be more than that. Uh, now, once you have the model run, you need to be able to compare the results from the modeling with the actual uh, experimental results because. There are sometimes things that externalities that you cannot account for. For example, heat leaks. There is no easy way to model the heat leaks from a, a, a water dispenser or an ice dispenser. So you will put an assumption, maybe it's uh, one watt, and then see the results. Or oh, no, one watt is not the right value. Maybe I have to increase to two watts and things like that. Small modifications here and there. Sometimes you uh, make an assumption on. Um, the fin efficiency or the fin effectiveness or the uh, number of fins uh, because you have to average them out one one way or another and as such you, you might end up tweaking the model as you move forward. okay so the next question is could um how do we optimize a customized refrigeration system that's a <laughs> that's a very important question so Customized refrigeration system we see mostly in commercial applications because uh, commercial uh, refrigerator appliance manufacturers are asked to change the dimension of their cabinet to uh, to, to like change the door display and so on and so forth. And from that point of view, um, we have to think about the refrigeration system from two two, two portions. There is the load. Right, which is the cabinet, and then there is the seal system, which is serving that cabinet. Right. Uh, the good thing about Sarah is that it integrates the impact of the seal system on the load and, and vice versa. So you will have to start from uh, from the uh, original design, and maybe the customization is you are your your uh, your glazing or your door is going to be half solid, half um, uh, glass and from that point of view you need to come up with an overall u value because if you put solid and you cannot define a u value if you if you use uh, glass you cannot define the thermal insulation and the thickness so what you end up doing is you assume one type so you, you assume it's it's all glass and then you say what is going to be the overall um uh U value for this strange shape though, and you have to do some manual calculation by yourself. Uh, if we talk about, for example, um, a customized, a, a strangely customized evaporator, sometimes you have an evaporator that is not a typical evaporator design, and you have to customize it to fit inside your cabin. So what you end up doing is you um, you will try to reduce the geometric parameters into the same geometric parameters that Sarah uses, and then try to um, use some correction factors, maybe the air distribution, there is some uh, air um, um, short circuit around it and so on, and try to move from the customized design to something that Sarah can, can deal with. And that's why we have this, uh, if you can reach me, there are one-to-one -one discussions that can be done. 
Okay, very good. So um, we had a question on um, could could we be using um, HC two hundred and ninety for domestic refrigerators and isobutane for commercial purposes? Um, yeah. So this is a good question. Using isobutane for commercial purposes um, is no problem. Uh, it can be done. The problem is, uh, can you find an isobutane compressor that is large enough for your appliance? If your commercial refrigerator or, or, or your commercial freezer is uh, is small enough, there is no problem from you, uh, of using it. You have to be careful because there are charge limitations, right? So with isobutane, the charge limitation is about 55 grams, and I, you have to be careful. Can you comply with the charge limitation? And can you find the compressor that serves your, your need? If it's, if it's there, if your load is low enough, I think isobutene is really good because it's easier, it's, it's cheaper. For domestic for domestic refrigerator in going vice versa, uh, propane is a uh, higher, higher capacity refrigerant than isobutene. So, can you find a propane compressor that is small enough for your domestic refrigerator? So now the problem is is on the other side. Can you find a small like a small enough propane compressor to put in your uh, domestic refrigerator? And if you find it, actually that's better because you have uh, a larger tolerance on the refrigerant charge. Thank you. Very good. So I have a question here from Gretchen. Um, say consumers especially residential consumers often have specific limited space for a refrigerator. So the increased wall thickness refrigerators might not have such strong, strong sales in the marketplace. Um, is there a way around the increased wall thickness in your opinion? Okay, so um, uh, can you repeat where the market is please? I'm sorry. I think it's the American market. Okay. So if it's uh, if we talk about the American market, um, there are two two ways around it. The first one is you can increase the height of your refrigerator, and by doing so, you can maintain the um, the refrigerated volume while increasing the insulation thickness. Um, although this is not also as advisable, and people are still not liking it. The next best thing is to start to incorporate vacuum insulation panels. Um, VIPs are becoming relatively cheaper these days, although they are still not cost effective. They are, like when you, when you try to put them on, on par with other technology options, they would be not cost effective. However, if you want to achieve a certain uh, label or a certain energy efficiency target, this would be your, your best bet, your best bet because you can achieve significant uh, significant load reduction with the same thickness. Okay, we're going to come quite quickly to the end of the session, but we'll take a couple more. Um, one question asked is, is Sierra free? Um, Sierra is free of charge, downloadable from the, the two web addresses that we, we offer, one on GitHub, um and the other unado.org slash sierra which will lead you through to the github um it's under the uh, mit license so it is available to you on very easy use terms um let's get back to which compressors are used in domestic applications um, Presumably um, one suitable for for isobutene or for propane. Um, most likely, um, there is. These are positive displacement compressors, uh, reciprocating compressors um, for the range of uh, refrigeration equipment that we have looked for um, at in the study. It's prim primarily reciprocating compressors. Uh, there are there are two options. There are the fixed speed and then the inverter or variable speed options. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to draw it to a close. All of a sudden, there's a lot of questions coming through that I hadn't seen. Um, but we will try and get back to you um, as soon as possible uh, after, after the webinar. Um, 
I would like to now move to the next slide. Um, uh, thank you, Omar, for, for the questions and answers. Um, we're nearing the end now, so what I'd like to do is call upon uh, Mary Nijama from UNEDO to make a closing statement. So Mary, are you able to hear us? And the floor is yours. Thank you, Nigel. Good evening, good morning. I'd like to share with you briefly my experience with the six participating companies. We happen to follow up with them to find out the views about the cost guidelines report and the sterile design software. It was indeed impressive to hear that they all found the report insightful and the software useful. One of the companies called Pojo in Guatemala is currently exploring software to improve the energy efficiency of their systems. UNIDA supports basic development and upgrade of design tools, like the upgrade of the Sera tool to a more friendly version that manufacturing companies can use. However, we encourage comp companies to customize the tool to meet their needs. The Sera tool, as mentioned by Nigel, can be found, can be accessed for free via GitHub and the full post guidelines report together with the a brochure can be downloaded from the UNIDO website. The links have been shared earlier. The webinar has been recorded and the link to the recording will be sent to your email together with a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you for taking up time to attend the webinar. Over to Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for your captivating words, and thank you to all the attendees for your attention. A couple of things just before you go. First, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Omar for his informative and enjoyable presentation. I would also like to thank KCEP, UNEDO, and the International Copper Association for supporting this project and many other world-class projects. A special thank you to the participating companies that uh, participated in our study and was uh, wishing to share their information in, in very uh, confidential and professional way. A special thanks here goes to Ms. Aya Saeed and the ASHRAE team for their excellent support and organization. And I would also like to thank all the attendees that joined us on the webinar today. It's a pleasure to have had you with us. Finally, don't forget to download the materials from the UNEDO site, uh, unedo.org slash Sierra. We'll have the next slide up, please, Omar. And send your feedback when you get the email from ASHRAE. Once again, thank you everyone for attending. I hope you found it rewarding. And wherever you are, have a great remainder of the day. <laughs>